I want to welcome you to this uh, session with us today. And uh, for the past two sessions we've had, we've been on the series Temperaments. And we're looking at relationships and temperaments. Um, uh, and I had always said from the onset that temperaments are actually, in my opinion, it's possible for any other person to view it uh, in another light. But in my opinion, uh, temperaments, I consider it the foundation and the bedrock of every relationship. The foundation and the bedrock of every relationship. Sorry about that. And the reason I consider it... Um, the foundation and the bedrock of every relationship is because every relationship has to do with nature, dealing with another person's nature, dealing with another person's trait, dealing with another person's behavior, other than yourself, you know. We can deal with us. You can deal with you. I can deal with me. But when it has to do with dealing with another person, other than myself, then I will have to learn the skills to be able to cope with the other person's differences, the other person's nature, the other person's traits and attributes or behavior. And, 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 and that's why I say for me, Temperaments is foundational when it has to do with relationships. Yeah, foundational because, you see, it explains why every human being behaves the way they behave. Why they talk the way they talk, why they react to things the way they react to it, um, why they um, relate with other people the way they do. So it's very key that each and every one of us, first and foremost, get to know their temperament. What is my temperament? And then when you've been able to identify what your temperament is, it's, it then becomes important for you to know, identify, and understand the temperament of the other person. Very key. Very important. So, whereas you can tell why you behave the way you behave and why you do things the way you do them, it is also important for you to be able to tell why the other person behaves the way they behave. That way you can understand people and you can relate with them better. Whether it's your boss, whether it's your friend, whether it's your colleague in the office, whether it's your classmate at school, whether it's your um, husband or wife or someone you are just dating or courting, when you know your temperament and you also know theirs, it, it makes relationship easy. Now, it's not as easy as it sounds, <laughs> uh, that's where understanding comes in, and that's where patience comes in, and that's where, you know, um, that season where we take our time to study each other becomes very important. In some cases, you know, um, that time for study may not necessarily be there. You will just need to work with patience, and then gradually you go into that uh, 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 level of uh, understanding where you really get to understand the other person. Take, for instance, you get employed in an office. That's, that's a new job. You know, uh, you don't have one week, two weeks, three weeks. You don't have the luxury of that time, that amount of time to say, uh, 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 let me work on getting to know each person here or let me work on getting to uh, exhibit certain traits of mine here and all of that. Uh, when it has to do with a job, for instance, <laughs> you can be fired under a week if certain things are not in place. 
You see, but that's different when it has to do with relationship with friends, uh, relationship with even family members, relationship with, you know, uh, 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 people you have, um, uh, maybe like your, 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 your spouse, your husband, your wife, and all of that. You don't have the luxury of that amount of time. So in cases like that, you will have to readjust faster. But you see, all of these things are important. Why? Because at the end of the day, it's going to help you to put things together and be able to relate with each other. Okay, so we had looked at uh, the choleric. We had looked at the sanguine in the previous classes. Today, we want to look at the third basic temperament. Now, I call it the third basic temperament because, like I mentioned earlier at the introduction, we have four basic temperaments. We have the sanguine, we have um, uh, uh, the choleric, we have the melancholy, we have the phlegmatic. Uh, where we have the sanguine and the choleric as uh, uh, extroverted temperaments, uh, we have the phlegmatic and the melancholy as introverted temperaments. And I explained extroverted temperaments to mean that these people, they, 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 they are social beings. They like the outgoing life. Uh, they draw their strength from interacting and relating with other people. Yes. And, and, and then the, uh, uh, the, the, the uh, uh, introverted temperament are those who draw strength from within themselves. They love their quietness. They love their space. They tend to want to protect their space because they draw strength from within themselves. So today, one of the temperaments we are looking at, which is the phlegmatic, is the temperament where strength is being drawn from within. These people are introverts. They like their quietness. They like their little corner. They like their privacy. They are not the outgoing type. Introverts. And it's easy for you to know an introvert. Say you walk into a room. <laughs> uh, uh, the intro I know these days we are, in a, uh, uh, we are in a season or an era in life where information and social media or not just social media, online activity is on the rise. And so it's, 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 um, it's, it's not out of place to get into a, 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 a gathering of people and almost everybody is on their phone. It's not out of place to have that kind of scenario. But you see, it depends on what people are doing on their phones. But then... You will, to, a, to a large extent, you would be able to spot the introvert. Because where the uh, extrovert might even be on his phone or her phone, in a little while, they will come out of their phones and get back into a conversation. Because that space is like too quiet for them. But the introvert can, in fact, while a heated conversation is going on, the introvert is buried in, <laughs> in his or her phone and may remain there for the rest of the duration of the time that they are, you know, uh, in that place. That is one easy way to spot an introvert. And that's because they get their strength from within themselves. I, I was sharing on um, a platform uh, earlier this evening, and uh, I made mention of some things about uh, the introvert, the phlegmatic, to be precise. And someone made a statement and said um, that she, <laughs> she used to think that she was possessed. Well, I think it was melancholy I was talking about, yes. That she used to think that she was possessed. Uh, and that's because of her behavioral pattern. So she would love to keep to herself. Uh, she, 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 she gets into those moods that even she cannot explain and all of that. And so I told her, I said, no, you're not possessed. <laughs> you are just exhibiting 
who you are by nature. When I say by nature, uh, there's this thing that uh, they usually say in philosophy, and that is everyone is born as a clean slate. In other words, we are a product of the things that we have learned and imbibed here on earth. Everyone is born as a clean slate. And so whatever you put in that clean slate or tamper with about that slate eventually determines who you, you, know, you become. And so this person who is saying something is wrong with them, no, nothing is wrong with them. It's who they are. But you see, as time goes on, this person has the opportunity to shapen his or herself in a way whereby she looks at the temperament that he or she has and can begin to say, okay, I love my strengths, but my weaknesses, which like we've always said in this, uh, uh, um, uh, in this session that we've had, that our weaknesses are the things that make people despise us or dislike us or want to get away from us. While our strengths are the complete opposite. They are the things that make people want to draw themselves closer to us. They are the things that make people like us. They are our strengths. And so, like I would always tell us that uh, 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 one of my mentors, Reverend Sam Oye, would say that you, when, or having identified your temperament, you should... Feed your strengths and starve your weaknesses. Meaning that your strengths are supposed to grow and improve. Because these are the things that make your relationships, in a sense, better. And then, starve your weaknesses. In other words, don't feed your weaknesses. Don't give your weaknesses the opportunity to grow. Because when it grows... It, ex it, 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 it brings about the expression of those things that makes your relationship poor. So that's it. So what we are going to be doing tonight and what we've been doing in the previous sessions is simply to reveal to some of us who may not realize why we do the things we do or who may not realize why the people we are in relationship to do the things they do, for you to come to that realization of why this is so. And when you do, you begin to understand or put yourself in a place where you can begin to say, okay, what do I do with this that I have identified, that I have discovered, in order and in a bid to make your relationship better. Awesome. So, the phlegmatic. Let's go right into the phlegmatic and um, let's learn a few things about who the phlegmatic is. The phlegmatic is naturally an introvert. They love their world and space. To the observer, the phlegmatic is extremely slow-paced and stubborn, slow-paced and stubborn. Uh, let me explain what that means. Um, <laughs> you can't get the phlegmatic to be um, motivated if they don't want to. Uh, so um, <laughs> there are some folks, when, when they listen to a motivational speaker speak, by the time they get out of that place, they're on fire. Uh, they want to practice. They want to do <laughs> what they've just heard. Uh, the phlegmatic would listen and they're like, mm, okay, <laughs> it's all right. They are not in a hurry in life. So we consider them slow-paced. You can hardly push a, phleg uh, a phlegmatic. You can hardly, so that's why um, that line says they are slow-paced and stubborn. Now, that's, that's, that's a little bit different from, um, from the uh, choleric who is uh, decisive when he makes a decision and he stands by it. You know, he has, he has a strong will. That's different. The, the phlegmatic is stubborn because, I beg, don't stress me. 
<laughs> uh, everything is just easy going and uh, sweet for the phlegmatic. That's why they say they are stubborn. So, um, pardon me, let me uh, draw an inference from um, two portions of the Holy Book in this illustration I want to give. I understand that anybody can be listening to me who may not be a Christian, but I want to crave your indulgence that I draw these uh, illustrations from uh, the Holy Book, which is the, uh, the Bible, and two of them. Now, um, there is a portion in the Bible where Jesus was teaching the people how to pray, and uh, he taught them how to say the Lord's Prayer. And there's a line in that, in that prayer where he said, Give us this day our daily bread. <laughs> and of course, we've, we've had people use that, um, you know, that word, daily bread, to express so many things uh, about how they go through life on a daily basis. It's like saying, okay, I have, I have enough portion for today. You know, um, that's the mindset of a phlegmatic. I have food for today, I'm good. <laughs> I'm not hungry at the moment. I've eaten. And, and maybe I have something for lunch, I have something for dinner. I'm good. Don't go telling or asking the phlegmatic, uh, what is your 10 years plan? Uh, they, are, they are not thinking about next week. Not to talk about 10 years or 5 years or 1 year. <laughs> so that prayer clearly explains or gives you an idea of the mindset of the phlegmatic. Give us this day our daily bread. Today's bread is enough. Don't stress me. So, 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 so for instance, uh, 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 I like using this illustration. Uh, where you have a situation where uh, a man who is married to a woman is a phlegmatic. So he is a phlegmatic and maybe his wife is uh, any other temperament. Let's even say the choleric, who is goal-oriented based, who likes to make decisions, who likes to have plans ahead of time. <laughs> if that man does not take uh, time, he, 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 he is going to frustrate his wife. Because that man is the kind of person who, when the wife asks him, um, honey, what are we going to do next week about this and that, about this and that? Uh, they, would they, 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 they will probably tell the woman, um, I don't know. What do you think? <laughs> they push the ball back in, uh, you know, in, into the court of the woman. Now, the thing is, this, this man, don't stress me with goals and targets. Don't ask me for plans. So he naturally evades scenarios that will uh, put him in a place to have structure. Now, this is not done intentionally. Like I said, this is who the person is. So it's not as if the person is, is intentionally saying, I, I, I don't, it's, 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 um, it's a default setting. And so we are trying to make us aware so that, for instance, if you know that you are a phlegmatic person, by nature, the next time someone comes to ask you, what do you think about this? Now, instead of you to go by your default setting and say, mm, I don't know, or what do you think? Because the person is asking you, so the person wants what you think. And not you asking them again, what do you think? So can you now be intentional and activate your thinking faculty, activate your reasoning capacity to think? And even if you don't do too much, at least have something to say about a particular matter when people ask you about it. So, again, like I said uh, uh, yesterday uh, on, on, on that uh, session I was having on WhatsApp with another group, uh, I told them, I said, um, I said that in that situation, for instance, where the phlegmatic is the man, and the uh, uh, woman or the wife is the choleric, 
you know she's a structured person. You know she deals with goals and targets, and she can set plans and even show you the steps to execute those plans. Now, that is her strength. So you, who is the phlegmatic, cannot, if you step into her strength to want to do it because you think you are the man, you will mess up because you are going to be struggling. Whereas for her, it comes naturally. So I, I, I would tell husbands who are phlegmatic, I say just to ensure that you maintain your uh, leadership role as the man. And of course, this woman, even though she is choleric, the fact that she is the woman, she has some certain expectations of you as the man to give some kind of leadership. Oh, women do. <laughs> it will amaze you uh, that women don't like to marry men who don't look like they have direction in their lives. Irrespective of what kind of woman that is. So, here is what I said. In a news, uh, uh, in a news situation, maybe if you walk in a newspaper house or a TV house, there's what we call the headline. <laughs> and then there's another thing we call the body of the news. So the headline carries, I mean, someone can just listen to the headline and have an idea of the picture of the news you're about to give. But by the time we now get into the main news story, we begin to get the details and the nitty gritty of the news. And at times, even uh, 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 misconceptions that the headline could carry begins to be clearer when the details of the news begin to come. So I would tell phlegmatics, who are men, I said, can you at least give the headline? <laughs> Don't push your wife, you know, away by telling her, eh, what do you think? And all of that. Can you give the headline? In other words, it's like you giving direction. Let's do this. And then you throw the weight of the details and the breakdown and the scheduling, and the illustrations to her, which is her strength. That way, it will look as though the direction came from you, because you gave the headline. But all the little breakdown that you are not comfortable with, naturally, you push it to her, and she executes it. That way, she's still achieving her strength as a choleric by putting details, direction, and pushing things. So, at the end of the day, it's a win-win because the man behaves like the leader and the woman actually carries the load of that direction. <laughs> see, these are some, of, uh, some, some technical things that a lot of people don't see in relationships that could, that, that could mess up a marriage or any kind of relationship just by losing out on some of these, you know, simple things. They are simple, but they are delicate. Because if you don't understand them, you wouldn't know how to navigate them. And that's why we are having these sessions, so that you both understand them and know how to navigate them in a bid to improve relationships. <laughs> so some of those infightings that I see, for instance, in marriages, they are unnecessary. It's just behavioral uh, uh, clashes that are causing these infighting. But with understanding, we can put things in proper perspective. In your office, it could be that Someone who you may consider as your equal, for instance, or even junior to you, is a choleric. And you are a phlegmatic. And when it comes to, you know, taking certain decisions, it's not your strength. You will struggle. Whereas if you let that other person step in, what did I call it? The headline. Give the headline 
and give him the weight of the construction. That way, you are not, you are not trying to you know, wade in your weakness. That's not your weakness. If you wade there, you would fail woefully. You will mess up. And then the guy would just be sitting down like this, or the, or the babe, and watching you fail. And he's like, mm, this guy, she be saying one do one. Make it, make it do one. <laughs> Whereas if you allowed them, at the end of the day, even though you are the leader, but they did all the connections, you will get the credit because you are their boss or superior. And even if your superiors higher than you know that it was this person's impute, the fact that you were able to coordinate your team, you still get a lot of credit. These are some of, some of the things that are taught in managerial uh, 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 courses. You don't have to be the one doing the execution for you to gain credit. It's the ability for you to put a team together and give them direction and then watch them run. That makes you valuable. And that's why in companies, it's not the, um, the actual execution staff that get the highest paid allowances. It's, it's those that are able to manage them and bring about the success that the company requires that actually get the highest paid. They are not putting their hand to the metal and doing all the work, but they know how to put people together. It's a skill. Okay. Let's proceed. The phlegmatic goes through life doing as little as possible, quietly, and expending little energy. <laughs> it is not clear whether the phlegmatic has very little energy but they expend very little energy. Or it is because they refuse to use what little energy they have to do certain things. They are very easygoing. Nothing really bothers them in life. That leads me, I said I was going to draw two um, uh, uh, infer uh, uh, inferences from the Holy Book, the Bible. And I got that first illustration from the, uh, um, from the Lord's Prayer. Now, this second inference or illustration, I, I want to draw it from one story in the Bible where uh, there was a storm in the middle of the sea and uh, Jesus was at the back of the ship, fast asleep. And his disciples were, you know, scared, afraid and struggling to uh, see how they can salvage both their lives and the uh, property on the ship, and Jesus was sleeping. And then they went to Jesus, and they shook him up and woke him up, and they're like, ah, Master, you don't care that we perish. <laughs> now, what am I bringing out of this story? There was a storm. There was a raging on the sea. There was a tempest, and this man was sleeping. Ah, <laughs> Again, that is the nature of a phlegmatic. How can you be asleep? I mean, sleeping in the midst of such tempest. Phlegmatics, mm, they know how not to worry in life. The same way I said that a phlegmatic is just give us this day our daily bread and they're okay. They are not thinking of next week. They are not thinking of next month. They are not thinking of next year. That is the same way nothing... Uh, <laughs> I told someone the other day, I said, for instance now, we have a high level of insecurity in our country, Nigeria. Uh, also, um, our economic state is not helping issues. The dollar is off the charts. So the dollar every day is on the increase. It will amaze you that there are certain individuals that every day when they wake up, they're like, what is this? How do I leave this country? This one, that one. The phlegmatic. Life is beautiful. <laughs> Life is beautiful. The phlegmatic is not worried. 
there's this general slogan, it is well. Even though it's a spiritual niche that people like to use when, when they uh, want to like, encourage themselves, uh, for the phlegmatic, that it is well statement is a natural thing for them. Uh, they are not saying it, uh, they are not forcing themselves to say it. They say it because indeed <laughs> it is well. <laughs> Oh dear. <laughs> Nothing really bothers them in life. The world may never know all the brilliant thoughts, great books, and spectacular works of art or wonderful ministries that have been buried with the phlegmatic. They seldom, if ever, use their ideas and talents because it would require expending too much energy and effort. to put these ideas into action. The phlegmatic, just like the melancholy, are procrastinators. Procrastinators. Now, these two groups of people are introverts and they procrastinate for two different reasons. So even though we are not yet getting into the melancholy uh, temperament, but I can point out one or two things because we've been going you know, back and forth in this issue and discussing them, uh, 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 each of them, uh, so that we can get a proper clarity by bringing real life issues and comparison. Yeah. So the melancholy is a perfectionist. And so, um, let's say a design, for instance, a design. So someone, an artist, is given a work of art to design and come up with something. Now, the reason the melancholy will procrastinate is because he has come up with about 30 designs before this time and they didn't look perfect to him. So he keeps going at the design in order to gain perfection. So he does this design. He tweaks it here. He looks at it. Mm, no, 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 no. He, so somebody comes tomorrow. He says, how about that job that I gave you? Uh, are you not done? And he's like, mm, not yet. I'm trying to fine-tune something. Two days after, he's still fine-tuning. He, 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 he does this and he's like, mm, this looks better. I don't like the other concept. He cancels it. And so that's the challenge with the um, melancholy. Perfection, his or her perfectionist nature will cause them to procrastinate. Whereas for the phlegmatic, it's about, mm, there's tomorrow. <laughs> there's no hurry in this matter. Mm. There's tomorrow. Mm. I'll do it tomorrow. Or I'll do it, uh, give me 30 minutes, I'll do it. Give me five minutes, I'll do it. That... Um, Action and energy that the choleric, who is a goal getter, who likes meeting targets, achieving them and going for the next target, that energy is not in the phlegmatic. That energy that the sanguine possesses when he gets into activity. Now, the challenge with the sanguine is that uh, the, the sanguine could leave a lot of things incomplete because uh, they could do this to a point and they rush into something else because uh, their minds are all over the place. You know, their mind is all over the place. But at least they get something done. And if the sanguine can actually train themselves, they could be very good, you see, because they also like activity. But the phlegmatic, ah, they don't like activity. They don't like stress. They don't like anything that gets them, you know, to uh, be involved in anything activity. So they want to procrastinate. I'll do it tomorrow. I'll do it tomorrow. So phlegmatics are also natural procrastinators. The phlegmatic sits back and watches other temperaments busy doing things <laughs> wrongly and looking at all the things in the world that need to be changed. They just watch people doing things wrong. They could have the solution, but mm, I beg. Uh, <laughs> just, 
just leave me. <laughs> Identifying the injustice is not difficult for the phlegmatic. However, they will seldom, if ever, initiate action against injustice. The phlegmatic. They will try to inspire others to do something, but are likely to personal, they, are, they, are, they are not likely to personally get involved themselves. So they could encourage others. Ah, it, you, this would work. This can work and all of that. But for them to step in to do it, not likely. Because of the kind of person that they are. The phlegmatic. So the phlegmatic has... Um, Uh, I love this one. The phlegmatic has no fear of rejection and can handle unaffectionate and hostile people. Like I said, they are easy-going people. They don't like confrontation. They don't. So uh, if, you have, if you are in a relationship with a phlegmatic, whether it's in your office or in a personal relationship, like you know, husband and wife or someone you are dating or courting, uh, you would see things that you don't like as a phlegmatic, but you, because you don't like confrontation, you almost will never tell anybody anything wrong about the things they do. Now, that's a weakness. It's a weakness, you see, because it is, it is not helping your relationship. It is straining your relationship, but um, you, are, you are suffering the pain, you are suffering the, the, the inactivity that is going on, you, but you are unable to voice out. Because you are just trying to be plain nice. So the phlegma, that's another name for the phlegmatic. Mr. Nice or Mrs. Nice. Nice. They don't want to hurt people. They don't want to get uh, the other person upset or offended. So they let things slide. And I say in relationships like marriage, for instance, letting those things slide all the time is not always good. So I tell people, I say, those things that you are burying under the carpet, one day they will resurface. And it's going to resurface with a bang. Now, am I saying fight over everything what are, and, and over every little thing? No, that's not what I'm saying. But don't let issues just go buried that ought to be thrashed. Because one day they will resurface. These are the things that eat deep into relationships. And you can just find your partner recoiling or getting away from you and, you know, having that time of fun and activity with other people. And then you're like, what's going on? What's going on? There are so many carcasses in the cupboard. The day they spill out, you'll be amazed how much uh, 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 a disaster they would have caused. In, in most cases, those, those, those things will be irreparable. The damage would have been or will be beyond repair. That's why a lot of times you hear people say uh, irreconcilable differences. Uh, why are you breaking up with this person? Why are you breaking up with irreconcilable differences? What? What, what do you mean by irre irreconcilable differences? They ought to have been reconcilable. But because no one was talking about it, they were just letting things slide, slide. It got to a point where they became irreconcilable. There's no difference that cannot be reconciled. The only element that you need to reconcile any difference is understanding. If both of you are in understanding and can connect to each other's frequency, you reconcile whatever difference there is. But it gets to that point because you've allowed certain things to go out of hand. Certain things have been buried, 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 buried. By the time they now show up, the phlegmatic. So, yes, it's good to be friendly. It's good for people to just like you and you to be nice. But don't be too nice to your own detriment and to the detriment of the relationship. That's not okay. Because at the end of the day, you will still suffer the consequences of that Mr. Nice that you've been all the while. Yes.
<laughs> I said something here in my notes. I said the, the phlegmatic almost never gets angry. <laughs> Is it that they are not pained by, 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 uh, uh, by certain things people do to them? No, that's not what I'm saying. Ego pain them, but uh, because of their nature. Because of their thinking that, mm, if I get angry, uh, angry now, I could escalate things. So another word for phlegmatics are peacemakers. They, they are peacemakers. So they, 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 they thrive better in peace than trouble. Mm. So you can be in a gathering now and, uh, uh, we have, and, and you have two people trying to heat up a disagreement. And uh, while there's one person who is trying to side the other person to heat up the fire the more, the phlegmatic, if the phlegmatic is there, mm -mm, he's trying to calm, he's trying to douse the fire. He's trying to get both of you to agree and to make peace. <laughs> they don't like fight. They don't like misunderstanding. And, and so if we get back into marriage, I usually would tell people, I say, um, in a situation where a woman who may or may not be a phlegmatic is married to a man who is a phlegmatic, don't go and cause trouble outside or find yourself in a fight outside and then say, uh, let me go and call my husband. Something happened and you pick up your phone and you say, uh, honey, uh, can you imagine this person insulted me? This person did this to me and all of that. <laughs> what are you expecting your husband to do? To go to the gym and do some push-ups and then come out and say, who is that person? <laughs> a phlegmatic would not do that. When he lands on the scene, he's going to be making peace. And you look at him and you say, this guy is not a man. He's a man. He's just a phlegmatic man. <laughs> and then you get upset. You say, this guy, you're not a man. You're a woman. No. You don't have to insult him. You don't have, that's who he is. By nature. Am I saying he should remain that way? No. But that change is not in your power to, to cause to happen. That change... Let me not call it change. That transformation or modification is not in your power to cause to happen. It's in his power to realize, like now we are talking about temperaments and we are talking about the phlegmatic. There are guys on this platform. And it's possible that there's a married person listening. So you can like, okay, ah, so this is, ah, that's why uh, the last time my wife, um, came to, you know, tell me someone insulted her and all of that. Oh, this is what she probably would have been expecting me to do. But this is how I handled it. It's possible she's not happy. So what does that man begin to do? He begins to know that, okay, I can put up a front. <laughs> this is not me, but I can create another me. Because this aspect of me, though it's good to be a peacemaker, but in another light, it could be causing a strain in my marriage. Meaning, in another light, it is negatively affecting my marriage or my other relationship with other people. So can I put up a front, shout a little, shake the place a little, and then say, you know what, um, okay, let's, let's do it this way. <laughs> so, so, so your wife can see that, ah, this guy, they shake storm oh. But just that he, you know, he likes peace at the end of the day. But, ah, in the shake store, he no, he no fall my hand. <laughs> Seriously. Now, it's not your person, it's not your nature, but see what it has done for your relationship. So, could you just um, intentionally know that, okay, even though this is good to do, but, mm, -mm this woman expected this. Can I at least put up a front? And over time, you might just find out that it becomes to, you know, it begins to become your second nature, where you know that mm, nobody treats my wife anyhow. Nobody just steps on my wife and thinks that he, can, he or she can go scot-free. They should know that she is married. So you begin to see that, okay, even though this is me, by nature, but I can begin to tweak some aspect of that me 
to make my relationship what? Better. So you, the woman, cannot tell your husband, you are not a man. You have to change this thing. Mm -mm. It's good for the man to have an idea for himself and come to the realization that, oh, this is good to do for the sake of relationship. So, but by nature, uh, like I said, they almost never get angry. They are the type of uh, uh, person that you rain insults on, you are hitting them, you are they, 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 they could just be telling you, calm down, no, it's okay, it's okay, it's okay. They are trying to pacify you. <laughs> Have you seen some men where, you know, maybe they are having issues with their wife, and their wife is hitting them, is abusing them, is talking to them, saying this, and, and it's as though they are not responding? <laughs> Uh, if you check very well, that guy could be a phlegmatic. Yes. They almost never get angry. They almost uh, uh, never want to, you know, participate in retribution or anything that looks like revenge or physical or, and, uh, and, you know, and all of that. That's the phlegmatic. Mm. They are observers, we said that earlier, who do not get involved nor expend much energy. They are cool. Complacent. The way they observe can cause them never to give of themselves and therefore they never receive either. Mm. Let me explain that. Uh, because uh, they don't give much. So let's say... Um, you are the kind of person who, um, more or less, I mean, think about it. In relationships where people give so much into that relationship, it, it makes the other person to also want to give back to them. You know, there are people that will go, you know, high over water and whatever just to accomplish something for you. They are the movers. So they just hear that, ah, you know, how are you? What's going on? And you say, ah, this thing is happening. They can just say, ah, where are you? Where are you? And before you know it, they've landed on the scene. They are mobilizing people. They are, they are trying to see what they can do to get you out of that challenge. The phlegmatic doesn't put in that much effort in relationships because of his somewhat cold nature or somewhat passive nature, where they, 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 they almost never get actively involved in certain things. And because of that, you know, it's like they, would I say, they get what they deserve, or they get what they put into the relationship as, you know, uh, a feedback or so. So, um, they also suffer <laughs> at the end of the day. Okay, so I, I, I want to just go through um, having given us that uh, um, introduction, more or less. I, I want to just go through um, the major weaknesses of the phlegmatic. The major weaknesses of the phlegmatic. So uh, I said earlier that the phlegmatic is not really moved. You know, they, they, they are not really motivated like other people could be. So that also makes them unenthusiastic. So because they are, they are only, okay, what's there? Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, so that statement made by Solomon where uh, he said there is nothing new under the sun, uh, uh, that's it for the phlegmatic. Okay. Uh, this is it. So, uh huh, uh huh. And so. <laughs> So they are, they are, they are, they are, you, can, you can call them unenthusiastic. They avoid responsibility. I mentioned that. They avoid responsibility. So um, they just like to stay aloof. Like I read earlier, even when they have the solution, they would almost be the last person to bring up that solution because they don't want uh, to be pushed in the forefront, you know. It, it, there's a tendency that when people prefer solutions uh, in a group, they believe that who else is better to, you know, accomplish this idea than the person who brought it. 
And so because he or she doesn't want to be found in that, um, in that quagmire where they are pushing the responsibility to them, uh, they, they know the solution, but they keep it. So they try to avoid responsibility. The phlegmatic could also be shy, shy, because they just want their space. They don't like to be in the forefront. They don't like to be in the limelight. So they can be shy. Then they can be too compromising. So I said earlier that the phlegmatic, um, uh, they don't like to hurt people, which in a sense, one should have thought that that's a good thing. But you see, because they don't want to hurt people, they can now begin to compromise. Compromise principles, compromise policies, compromise so many things. So many things. So imagine if uh, a policeman, for instance, is a phlegmatic, and he's supposed to want to arrest you. You see, because um, his, his arrest is based on his action or inaction. So it's not as though there's um, a camera in all cases. In some cases, there could be a camera. But if there's no camera and there's nobody to say that uh, this person committed this offense and you as a policeman, you let them go. A policeman who is a phlegmatic could just see you and, in fact, look, even look the other way because he's like, ah, I'm going to arrest this guy now. He's going to be put in jail uh, and all of that. He begins to uh, mix his nature with his job. That is unprofessional. And so that's why I say here that a phlegmatic could be too compromising. Could be too compromising. You have a job, you have an assignment to do something, but you now bring in your emotions and your person into it. That's not okay. That's not good. That's a weakness. So when you are in a relationship and uh, as a phlegmatic, understand that you cannot be blending your personality with professionalism. That's not okay. That's not okay. On, um, on work, I want to mention some of the strengths of the phlegmatic when it has to do with work. Yes. So, um, the phlegmatic is competent and steady. Competent and steady. Now, this comes from the loyal nature of the phlegmatic. The phlegmatic is seen as a loyal person. And his or her loyalty stems from the fact that um, they don't want to hurt their boss. They don't want to be seen as unproductive. They don't want to get their boss or superiors angry or upset. So they would push themselves to ensure that they do certain things because of that singular aspect of not wanting to upset or offend their bosses. And so they put, a phlegmatic can stay on one particular job for years, five years, 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, 30 years. In fact, they retire on the job. Not because the job is very comfortable, not because the job is well-paying, but you see, because they cannot even stand to approach their boss to say, I want to resign. In fact, even if they go say, t tell their boss, I want to resign, and the boss now begins to pretend as though they are breaking down, as though, ah, you are very valuable to my company, and this and that and this and that, and begins to tell them sweet stories that they've heard over and over again. They will yield. And they'll say, okay, sir, it's okay, it's okay. I, I, I believe you, sir. This, this, I, I, I know, like you said, this will change. And they'll get back into that company, and the things will not change. <laughs> and they'll say, ah, if I knew I would have resigned that time, oh, things have not changed. And they will make up their mind again, I want to resign. And the boss will come again, wash them, wash them, wash them, wash them, sweet talk them. And they're like, mm, oh, wow, ah. <laughs> the phlegmatic. 
So you can call them competent and steady in that sense. It's a strength, in a sense, and also can be a weakness. Don't un See, I want you to understand when I talk about strength and weakness. Something can be considered a strength at some point, and at another point, it can be you know, seen as a weakness because of the twist involved in the person who is exhibiting these traits. So, uh, for instance, uh, I, I, I said the other time that uh, for, the, uh, for, the, um, for the choleric, being firm and decisive could be a strength because that decision could lead a company or a relationship into something benefiting. But at times, if that choleric person is too firm, that he or she resists change, resists diplomacy, resists some uh, kind of twist here and there that could also bring benefit to the company or to a, a relationship, at that point, it is seen as a weakness. And so it's good for us to have that understanding so that we can know at what point, what to do, and how to navigate our relationships. Very, very important and very, very key. Other strength of the phlegmatic, the phlegmatic is peaceful and agreeable. I said they are peacemakers. Um, the phlegmatic has administrative abilities, and, and that's because the phlegmatic is... <laughs> Mr. or Mrs. Nice, you know, so uh, they know how to, you know, um, harness people. They know how to, um, since they are diplomatic, they know how to, uh, if I may use the word, bend people to their will by not being bossy or forceful, uh, by not merely being enthusiastic, you know, about it, but, you know, they know how to get into people through twists and turns, and get people to also, you know, uh, work with them. So they have some good administrative skills. They, they, they are very good mediators of problems. Yes, very good mediators, because uh, they kind of like, because they are diplomatic, you know, they kind of like know how to put uh, themselves in other people's shoes. Yes, they are very thoughtful when it has to do with things like that. They are very good mediators. Uh, again, like I mentioned earlier, they tend to avoid conflict. So that's a good strength. I mean, uh, meaning that you, if you have someone like that uh, in an office, you know, um, you hardly will have to be hearing this person exchanging words with another office uh, 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 a colleague or staff, you know. Because they, 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 they avoid conflict. They know how to see things and look the other way. Is that a good trait? Yes. Could it also be a weakness at some point? Yes. Because like I said, the more you leave things buried under the carpet, the more it's going to explode. So for this kind of people, uh, while they avoid conflict, doesn't mean that they will not deal with conflict. Now, that's where uh, uh, in... Uh, intentionality comes in. So when you know that, oh, okay, this is why anytime there's an issue in my office, I don't usually talk. Is it a good thing? Yes. But it could build up to become a bad thing. So could I do it differently in as much as that is my strength? So it's good that I don't blow up and begin to yell at one another. But can I take this particular issue to a conclusive end? either by having a discussion about it later on with the person, or I go to my superior who is in a position to deal with this thing so that at the end of the day, it doesn't reoccur, especially in a, a working environment or in a relationship environment, either husband and wife and all of that. Nobody likes things reoccurring. People like things being dealt with. So even though the phlegmatic is the type of person who um, uh, doesn't want to uh, 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 have that conflict, but deep down inside them, they would have preferred if this issue never came up again. But they keep avoiding it. They keep, they keep avoiding getting to do something about it. But then, 
if you know, like now, that we are dealing with, uh, 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 you know, on this subject, if you know that, okay, this is why I am not confrontational, could it be that you can begin to work your mindset on, okay, I'm not confrontational, but this thing needs to be dealt with. So how do we go about it? What do we do? It makes you come up with innovative ideas on how to deal with certain things and still not be confrontational, but deal with issues. Okay. So it's a strength. Now, the uh, phlegmatic, one of the strengths here is that the phlegmatic is good under pressure. Good under pressure. And like I used that illustration earlier where the sheep was in, uh, uh, you know, in a, a, a going through a storm and Jesus was sleeping at the back of the boat, uh, the phlegmatic knows how to be calm under pressure. Under pressure. The world could be collapsing all around them and they are at rest, which is a very good trait. Then on work, of course, uh, just to go through um, the weaknesses here, not goal-oriented, lack self-motivation, uh, they are hard to get moving, they resent being pushed, <laughs> they are lazy and careless, discourages others, would rather watch than do. These are some of the uh, uh, weaknesses of the uh, phlegmatic, especially in a work environment. So I'm going to just run through uh, briefly uh, in the next five minutes so we can round up. Uh, I'm going to just run through briefly on the strengths and weaknesses of the phlegmatic when it has to do with dealing with friends and personal relationships like someone you are dating or husband and wife situation. So uh, the strengths here, uh, they are easy to get along with. Yes, easy to get along with. They are pleasant and enjoyable, inoffensive. <laughs> they are good listeners. Uh, so, yeah, very good listeners. So if you have someone, I mean, they may not understand Jack about what you're saying, but they will pay attention. Very good listeners. They know how to listen, you know, and, and, and that's a very good trait. A lot of people don't know how to listen. And like I would usually, like I, like, like I would usually tell people, uh, listen to understand. Don't listen to respond. A lot of people listen to respond. It's like a lawyer who gets into a case, a court case, and he's not listening to uh, his opposition to understand their point of view. Rather, he or she is listening to the opposition to catch them in their talk. And that's how a lot of us listen. And it's poor for relationships. It's bad. Don't listen to people to respond to them. Listen to people to understand their perspective, to understand their point of view. It will enhance agreement when you relate with people in this light. So they are good listeners. They have a dry sense of humor. <laughs> Like, like I said earlier, they are unenthusiastic. You know, they could finish listening to a motivational speaker and, okay, what's there? What's it about? You know, uh, at the same time, you know, they have a dry sense of humor. <laughs> uh, so uh, it's possible that if you crack, crack a joke with a phlegmatic person, at the end of your joke, you, you, you'll be wondering uh, who, who is the joke, if it's the joke you told or you yourself are the joker. Uh, because... They, they may not laugh. <laughs> they, they are themselves, they are looking for the joke, inside the joke. <laughs> okay. Um, the phlegmatic has many friends. It's a strength with relationships. And uh, uh, having many friends doesn't necessarily mean that they make many friends. It's just because uh, they, 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 they show themselves friendly. And because they are yes people, they almost never say no. They don't want to hurt people. So for some reason, people like being around people like that who are always validating them and not having to, you know, uh, say something negative about them because, of course, the phlegmatic, again, is unconfrontational. Mm. They, they don't know how to tell you the way it is. So you like people like that around you, people who probably only validate you, you know, than say something negative. 
<laughs> so that's why um, people would like them as friends. But is that good for the relationship? No. Weakness, when it has to do with relationships and friends, um, the phlegmatic dampens enthusiasm. And that's because they themselves, they are not enthused. They are not motivated and easily inspired about certain things. So uh, since they don't even have that push in themselves, uh, they lack the ability to push others or to motivate or inspire others. So they dampen enthusiasm. Uh, they stay uninvolved, and that's because they don't like too much of activity. Just leave me for my space. Uh, they are not exciting people to be around too much. Uh, they could be indifferent to plans. You know, you ask a phlegmatic, what do we do? And you're like, mm, yeah. what do we do? What do we do? Somebody comes up with an idea now, or, and they say, oh, that's good, that's good. Another person comes with an idea, mm, this one is good, though. Because they don't know how to tell this person, no, this is your idea, I don't like it. I go with this other idea. They don't want to hurt you. So, 10 people come with 10 ideas, and the phlegmatic is seeing all the ideas as good. <laughs> That's a major weakness. That's not good at all. But, you see, the phlegmatic uh, doesn't want to be, you know, walking out of that meeting and someone saying, ah, you kicked against my idea. The phlegmatic doesn't want that. So they will buy everybody's idea, or they buy a piece from everybody's idea. Eh, buy this one, buy this one, buy this one. They will never give idea by themselves, but they, they will. <laughs> so they are indifferent to plans. So this will work. Yeah, mm, I think so. I think so. I think so. I think so. What do you think? Mm, I think, uh, what do you think too? No. It's a major weakness. It's a major weakness. It's a major weakness. So there you have it about the phlegmatic. We've been able to go through you know, the kind of person uh, that the phlegmatic is, and we've seen some strengths and some weaknesses that the phlegmatic has. And the purpose for this is so that you can tell that, oh, this is me. I am a phlegmatic. Why? Because these are the things I can relate with, excuse me, as the things that I do. The phlegmatic. And then you can begin to understand, mm, this one is not okay. Oh. This one, okay, this is fine. This, is, this, this I can consider a strength and I can beef it up. I can boost it up. But this other one is not good. It's a weakness. So what do I do? I begin to counterbalance my expression of these traits so that at the end of the day, I would not just be uh, uh, called Mr. Nice or Mrs. Nice, whereas the relationship is not making progress or the relationship is, 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 is going downhill rather than improving because of my actions. It makes you become aware. And then if you know someone or you're in a relationship with someone who is a phlegmatic or exhibiting phlegmatic tendencies, it's also easy for you to understand where they are coming from. So rather than uh, attacking or fighting them, you are dealing with them or relating with them from the place of understanding. And then that helps how you work with them. And even if you think that you can be a source of influence to their transformation or modification, there's a way you are going to go about it intelligently and with wisdom. You don't just go straight and say, ah, bros, this is why you behave like this. So you have to do this about this. About, no, 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 you don't. You, you, you borrow, at that point, you borrow the attributes of a phlegmatic and become diplomatic in a sense of how you can get this person to um, um, recondition their minds. It is their responsibility to do. Like I always would tell us when I have, uh, you know, sessions like this, you cannot change anybody. People only change when they are convinced that that change is necessary. If they don't have that conviction, they will not initiate that change. And in initiating that change, I will always tell people, be patient with change because change takes time. Change takes a process. 
there is the process of change. No change is automatic. Nobody just goes to sleep and wakes up and then change happens. No. It will take the willful participation of you in getting yourself to change. So even you, who do not like that person's behavior or actions, and so long as the person has agreed to change, learn to be patient with them. Occasionally, depending on the kind of relationship, they can be upgrades, they can be updates, they can be reassessment of certain characteristics and traits. But you must learn to be patient with people who, even when they have chosen or decided to change, because change will never happen overnight. So that brings us to the end of uh, this session. I, I said earlier that it was going to be a quick, quick session, and that we've been able to achieve on the phlegmatic. And so now you know and you understand um, the temperament called the phlegmatic and why they are the way they are and why they do things the way they do things. And if you are one, now you understand better. And if you are not one, but you know one, or you are in relationship with one, now you can understand better also why they are the way they are. And with this, uh, you know, with arming yourself with this information, uh, it's to get back out there and practicalize this in getting to relate with such people, or if this explains you in getting to relate with other people as well. That is it. And uh, thank you for staying with us uh, tonight on this session of uh, dealing with temperament and relationships, you know, zeroing in on the phlegmatic. Uh, we have one more class coming up, and that is <laughs> the melancholy. And I'm always excited when I talk about the melancholy because I am primarily a melancholy. So I, I, I can't wait to get into that class. I can't wait to get into that class. And uh, I look forward to also uh, having you in that class for the melancholy class. So thank you for staying with me this evening. Thank you very much. And God bless you.